too. Oh, yeah, this is for the Senate. Oh, okay. We're going to make Cardin do something right. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> Is that live? We're live now. But you, if you, you can see over there. Anybody want a pen? Yeah. Yeah. These are extremely high quality Michael Anderson pens. Eleven point two cents a piece. You don't have a J.P. Morgan one? Come on, man. <laughs> These are so cheap. <laughs> Look, I got the red top one. Those were 14 yeah, cents. We had to downgrade. Oh, the Scottish uh, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. The, the main one they around. Hey, Mike, uh, I think when... Yeah? Yeah, that's awesome. Hey, welcome. Just take one. How are you? Yeah, just pass it down. I think this is what I'm going to do because I get a great picture like this when we get ready to start. When uh, the delegate comes on, we'll just cover this up. Uh, and I, I was like, man, I gotta stop by Walmart and see because they you know, get the little poles that you and they I think they make little cushy ones. Where you put here too. I was like, man, thank you. Should get one of those. I didn't have a chance. Should we wait or should we get started? Go. Okay. Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, this is Mitch Short, Campaign for Liberty. Um, can we have a volunteer to lead us in the um, Pledge of Allegiance? Jim. Come on, Jim. Okay. <laughs> All right, is everybody ready? Stand up. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. All right. I just did this today. Okay. Um, so the first order of business is our second order of business is our treasurer's report. All right. How are we doing? Uh, we have two hundred and ninety-one dollars. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had something else to say. <laughs> the only thing we spend money on are those yellow postcards, and it's the postage. Each one is thirty-four cents. All the supplies are donated. All the labor is donated. Uh, unfortunately, the post office isn't that uh, charitable. Um, did anybody not get a yellow postcard in the mail? Well, yep. Chris, Chris gets them, but I don't get them. That's we live in the same house, oh. but it doesn't have my name on it. You want your own? No. <laughs> you deserve your own. We'll put I you mean, on the list. Can we just put both of our names on it? Oh, Absolutely. <laughs> Make a note. Okay. Um, that, that's our only expense. Um, uh, what we might try to do though, is we try to get rid of that expense. Um, you know, every 34 cents that we can save is money that we can use elsewhere. Um, so uh, we're, we're trying as much as possible to update uh, email addresses. Uh, I know some of you got my spam from whenever it was last night or this morning. Apparently I'm not very good at spamming, Norman tells me. <laughs> I apologize. But um, if you didn't get email from me, I think it was last night, um, there's a sign-in sheet going around. I think it's up here. You just make sure we have your email address. Uh, I know we probably have almost all of yours, but just let us know. That way we can try to save on the postage cost by, by emailing things out. Um, now, before we get started uh, with um, with our presentation from Delegate Schmiegel, um, would it be all right if we passed the hat and tried to raise a little bit of money? Sure. Okay, how this is our treasury. This is money. Very good. <laughs> Same box. That's all. I'm gonna give you more. We recycle. Money. I'm gonna give you more after I get another beer. <laughs> Mike, what was the response from uh, last 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 night's meeting? Did you notice? Yeah, I'll, well, you mean okay. the, the petitions? Yeah. Yeah, let's go on to that in just a second. Um, 
So in terms of old business, uh, last uh, month at our first meeting, uh, Norman was kind enough uh, to speak to us about uh, the audit the Fed bill. And um, we collected petitions, as I guess everybody knows, and we sent them to uh, Andy Harris. And I didn't get a letter, but did any of you get a letter in the mail from him? What did it say? That he was a co-sponsor, that he planned to vote for it. Yeah, excellent. I looked it up on the, uh, on the House website just to see, because it had 230 some odd co-sponsors, and I figured maybe he was one, so. Yeah, that's great. Did you see we had an article in the paper about it, too? Yes. Good old Star Democrat, they reprint that press release. <laughs> um, I, I handed out something I got from the state campaign for leadership folk, campaign for liberty folks, um, because the bill could perhaps, maybe, if the are in alignment, come up for vote in the Senate. So um, if anybody wants to sign that petition, you can turn it yourself, or we can fax them in the morning. Um, but I passed them out, there's more up here if you need them, um, to go to Senator Cardin and Senator Mikulski, who will, of course, not go for it. Now, I know, hey there. I know um, there are some, um, some candidates running for office. Uh, I know there's a certain candidate many of us support who's still running for president. Um, Joe, I'm wondering, could you give us an update on uh, maybe a campaign or two? Sure. Where to begin? Um, not too much to report. Still, still going on towards the convention. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't look like we're going to have the delegates to actually be nominated from the floor. However, we do have enough delegates to really be a thorn in the side of the establishment down there in Tampa, which they are none too pleased about. Um, the uh, main delegation has, uh, the GOP is refusing to seat them um, until they sign a pledge to Romney or something like that. Um, that's about it. Hmm. How can they do that? Uh, they write the rules like the American Well, people in America. <laughs> With a K. Thank you. <laughs> uh, any other candidate updates? Okay. Um, so, uh, you know it didn't rain for three months, and we did a sine wave, so it rained. Um, we had a really successful sine wave it was a, about two weeks ago. It was a lot of fun. We went, to, we all got together for about an hour on Saturday morning, and we stood at the park and ride at 50 and 404, and we had a really fantastic time. Uh, these are some of the folks who were there. Uh, some of them are here tonight. You can see some of the uh, homemade signs. I was driving up. It wasn't even 10 yet. And I was about to text Michael, it's a rain out, man. <laughs> Next 30 seconds, I'm pulling up to the intersection. These idiots were out here waiting. <laughs> <laughs> what was our first time? It was the first snow, the only snow of the year. Yep. And it was the coldest, windiest day of the year. Yep. The only rain in three months. So we're going to do it again. On the 18th, the barbecue right? barbecue got rained out. Yeah, the barbecue yeah. got rained out. Yeah. Nicholas really did a great job making uh, this big art at the Fed sign and some others. Absolutely. Really give him credit for that. I'll make a motion we do the next sign wave in the middle of hurricane season. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so we'll have another sign wave. It's just, it's great to do it. It's a lot of fun. Um, and all these wacky people drive to the beach on Saturday morning. So I just picked uh, Saturday, August 18th, the same place. Uh, the Route 50 park and ride, uh, just for an hour from 10 to 11. Uh, we'll invite the press to come again. Of course, they won't come, but we'll send an article and they'll run it. And um, just Next time, maybe we'll call the police. You know? <laughs> That's the next time, maybe we'll just call the police on ourselves. <laughs> if you want to come, I think it'd be a lot of fun. I know we always have a lot of fun. and Just bring a homemade sign um, and have a lot of fun with it. It was great. I was actually really yeah. surprised like how many people were... I thought we were going to get a lot of... I was worried I was going to get like a slushy thrown at me or something. <laughs> but really, we got like two people who gave us a finger and then 8,000 people who honked and waved and gave us thumbs up and it really like felt good because yeah. you kind of, you know, we have these meetings and it's awesome that everybody that's here comes, but it seems like such a small group of people talking about what we talk about, but people really support it and they really it agree great. with it. It was awesome. I actually like had come off of a really bad discussion on Facebook where basically like people were calling me an idiot so I like I was really bummed out and going to that seeing like there are actually people who feel the same way we do it was awesome it was so cool it, it was amazing so now on the 18th you and Chris have a, uh, a performance <laughs> don't you 
Yeah, we're playing at the outlets. Very exciting. Right in front of JoJo's Cupcakes. <laughs> so, Congratulations. you know, we're rock stars. It's <laughs> cool. Uh, one to four. At one o'clock? Yeah. Awesome. All right. <laughs> we had to be aware there were there was a counter protest to this. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm saying that guy out. <laughs> You think you escaped from the loony bin? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't be too far off. <laughs> okay. Um, are there any announcements? Um, anything anybody wants to share about what's going on? Um, yes. Um, I don't know if this is news to everyone or just that I just heard about it. Um, Andy Harris actually told me personally that they're looking for QE3 in September. Mm -hmm. um, so, time working on that, we really need to at least say something about that. Uh, I know Aunt Paris is already against it, so. Oh, that's great. See what happens. Can you tell everyone what QE3 is? Uh, it's quantitative easement, or quantitative easing, and this is the third time I've done it. It's basically a bailout. Mm. Um, what happens is the Fed prints more money. Well, they don't actually print the money, obviously. They make an accounting entry, and uh, a lot of major banks get a lot of um, credit to throw around, and they don't. Nothing good comes up. We all just get more information, more debt. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I know most of you know that I do investment work for a living, and I gave a workshop last night, and we talked about quantitative easing in Ben Bernanke. Um, it was the first time I've ever given the workshop where I talked about who Ben Bernanke is and what he does with his money. <laughs> And this is really interesting because this was a group of people who were probably 55 to 60 years old, ordinary people, not really politically or economically minded, and um, they sort of kind of knew who Ben Bernanke was. And I explained he was the nation's top banker and he was the guy who kind of understood the economy um, more than anybody else. And um, I asked, you know, if they wanted to know what he had done prior to becoming Fed chairman. And I told him that he studied the Depression and that his conclusion was that the Fed didn't print enough money during the Depression. So then I asked them, do you all want to know what he actually does with his own money? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 80% of his money is in insurance company annuities, and 20% is in Canadian government bonds. The guy who's in charge of all the banks, this is what he does. Tells me he really doesn't have a lot of confidence maybe in his job and what he's doing. How did you do that? Google. He had to uh, report that it was in 2010 or 11. Um, you can find it. It took me about 30 seconds to find it. Just Google Ben Bernanke investment holdings, I think, something like that. Right there? So you had 20% in Canadian bonds. 20% in Canadian government bonds and uh, not quite 80% in insurance company annuities. That's a credible source. Yeah, it was, it was he had to disclose it. Yeah. One more announcement. Yeah. Um, we do have a team working on a website, and they are sitting to the left of me. <laughs> So All right, we will have a nice website up soon. Outstanding. Okay. Any other announcements? I should I should make one. Um, yeah. It's it's an issue that we're working on, um, having to do with with drone usage, um, yeah. mainly in our territory. That so that would that would. Queens County Sheriff's had obtained a permit. Evidently, it, it expired, but you know that's that's an issue that we're concerned with um, privacy mainly. Um, so we've started some correspondence with, with the Sheriff's Department um, and they haven't said that they're not pursuing another permit, um, but they said they, they don't plan to, they don't have one. Um, so we're, we're looking for, to, to, to get back in touch with them to get a, something more, fir more of a firm commitment that they will not uh, try to obtain a new permit. Well, that would be interesting. All right. Wow. All right. Yeah, there are drones flying over our airspace. Yeah. And crashing the two stars. I was made aware of it due to the uh, the news report of one crashing. Uh, sure. Southern Eastern Shore. Yeah. But they, this is a training ground for them, essentially. Yeah. They they build them right here in town. <laughs> yeah. Built the drones right here in town. Yeah. Right here in Easton. I actually, didn't they close that plane down though? Did they close? I it? thought they uh, thought I thought I heard a rumor that they closed that plant down, because they make them here and in Texas, 
and I think they are just making them strictly in Texas, but I could be wrong about that. A couple months ago, they were just getting up and running. I'm planning to do a drone presentation in, what, November? I think November, okay. yeah. Oh, sweet. So we'll learn more about it then, so you, really. keep you updated. Thank you, Nick. Uh, in September, a market calendar, September 12th, we ordered a movie, uh, I ordered it on Monday from the Tenth Amendment Foundation, and it's a movie about nullification. And it's actually pretty good. Um, it's not boring. Um, so it should be coming, and uh, a lot of people believe that when the Supreme Court declared that Obamacare to be constitutional, that was the end of it. We were stuck with it unless we overturned the law. Well, what this uh, movie talks about is the state's right to declare federal law unconstitutional. So we're really looking forward to this. Just mark your calendar. It'll be here at 7 o'clock on September 12th, and definitely bring a friend or someone you think might be interested. Great. We also have, uh, coming up on uh, Sunday, September 30th, the state campaign for leadership folks are coming here to train our chapter on being liberty activists. Uh, it's going to be from 1 o'clock until 4 o'clock. Um, if you can go to Facebook and uh, just note whether or not you'll be able to come to give kind of an accurate count for attendance. Um, it's just it's such a really neat thing. Uh, there was a um, uh, a statewide training, uh, and I think I put it on the Facebook group about two weeks ago. And I know a couple of us went to it, and just the things we learned about how to be successful activists, and you know, like um, when you're encountering an elected official, you know, how do you really get under their skin? What are the things that they hate? You know, and, and how do you actually be effective at at, at, at change? So uh, they're coming down to teach us all how to do this. And uh, if you want to come, it's obviously free. Um, just you know, let us know on Facebook um, and bring a friend for sure. But our, our, our big speaker tonight, um, the man who we all came to hear, is Delegate Mike Schmiegel. Uh, Delegate Schmiegel uh, was highly recommended uh, for his knowledge and, and passion in uh, liberty issues. And, and one of them, that he's been a real leader in uh, helping folks understand the dangers of, are these red light cameras that are popping up everywhere. So um, Delegate Schmiegel represents District 36. He's a Republican. He uh, serves, uh, what is it, Kent, Caroline, and uh, Queen, Anne's. Queen Anne's Cecil. and Cecil. And uh, we're real fortunate to have him tonight. So uh, to join me in welcoming up uh, Delegate Michael Schmidt. Um, if it's OK with everybody, what I'll do here is I'll talk a little bit uh, about what the red light cameras go over that. Then I'll open up for questions for anything you want. I know with the special session starting tomorrow, some of you may have questions for things other than the topic here today. I'll be glad to answer any questions you have about anything going on in the legislature. For those who don't know anything about myself, um, I was born and raised here in Maryland. Uh, I was 16, I joined the Marine Corps. I got shipped out to uh, the Midwest to get out against Canadian air attack uh, out in Greenwich, Glenview Naval Air Station, Great Lakes. So uh, uh, after I got out of there, I decided that I was going to be a Soviet foreign policy expert. Went to school for studying dialectical materialism. Got out uh, when I got out in 1985. Uh, get ready to take on the Soviet Union and uh, in 89 when I graduated Ronald Reagan and I got rid of the Soviet Union in 85 so I went back to law school there. I came back actually to go to the University of Maryland and they said after I got a Marine Corps I stayed six months too long to get my degree and they said you're no longer a resident of the state of Maryland you got to pay out-of-state tuition. So here I had to pay out-of-state tuition as a United States Marine who stayed six months outside the state too long and now we're dealing with people who don't even live in the country getting in-state tuition. So, you know, we've come a long way. Yeah. The wrong way. Uh, anyway, I serve on the Judiciary Committee. I've been there 10 years in the Maryland House of Delegates. Um, as a member of the Judiciary Committee, I also sit on one of the most important committees that maybe many of you don't know what it is. It's the AELR Committee, Administrative, Executive, Legislative Review. And for those who are interested in liberty and interested in what's going on in Annapolis, watch that committee. That's the committee who, when we're not sitting, writes all the regulations. We pass a bill, the perfect example, that just came out, the BAT technology. We say you can only use the best available technology for the septics in the areas in the legislature. We say critical areas and in the coastal bay areas. Goes to the committee, um, it goes to the agency, and Secretary uh, Summers for the Maryland Department of the Environment says, you know what, even though the legislature said absolutely it's limited to this area, we're going to make it statewide. We think we can do it through regulation. So many things that the legislature says, this is your limit, they are overbroad when they write the regulations, or under-inclusive if we get a win and we want to do something that protects something, they're under-inclusive. So watch the 
legislative, administrative, executive, legislative review, AELR, and what you do is go to your legislator. Anything you're interested in, you're interested in septic regulations, you're interested in plumbing, tell them you want all of the paperwork that comes out, because I get little stacks of paper a couple times a month, and they tell me all the new regulations. I look through them, except for the ones that, uh, some things I just, I, I can't get into, because they'll put me to sleep. But, but about 90% of them, I look through, the, the, pick these areas. I don't think anybody else really looks through as many, and I find a regulation that I find, wait a minute, this affects the oystermen, get an oysterman in here, ask them what they think of this. This affects the people who are using the water, ask them what they think of this. And then we go down and we can raise our hand and call a hearing, and you can come down to the hearing and have input on those regulations. So that's just something I wanted to give you uh, information about that I think will, you know, knowledge is power. And that's a very powerful committee, and having knowledge of it will help all of you watching uh, your liberties. Um, now with respect to the speed cameras, I started something uh, a few <coughs> years ago, which is, uh, we do the Liberty Scorecard. And so what I do is I look at every vote that comes out in the House and the Senate, and I look at every legislator and how they vote. And we pick out things that we call Liberty votes. And one of those, I have to the speed cameras. If you voted for speed cameras, I stood up on the floor and I said, freedom is seldom lost in one fell swoop. It's lost one camera at a time. And so we stood up and said, if you vote for speed cameras or you vote for red light cameras, that's a vote against Liberty, and you got a negative vote on your Liberty votes. And so you can get the Liberty vote, Liberty scorecard, and you can look at how every legislator votes on different issues involving your liberty. Now this year I haven't got it out yet because we keep having unnecessary special sessions. And so I'm waiting because I'm sure that what's being done, we want to put into the Liberty scorecard. So what happens with the red light cameras? First off, what you need to know, and I hear you're going to start them tomorrow, is it? Or, or very shortly, they're starting right here? Cambridge. Cambridge. Oh, Cambridge? Cambridge today. Okay. Um, what happens with the red light cameras is they tell you that this is all about safety. When you have the hearings, you find out if it were about safety, would they shorten the yellow light time on the red light cameras in order to catch more people? Jeez. Of course not. They actually do. What happens is also the with the red light cameras, the incidents of rear end collisions go way up. And there was somebody who just, um, I, I forget who it was, um, the city that just found that they went up and they, uh, I'm trying to see, I wrote it down, I, I did research before I came here, somebody had just reversed that in Maryland because they had went so far up, one of the police chiefs came out and said, look, our rear end accidents have went up since we did this. It was to prevent T-bone collisions for people running red lights. Well, the problem is when they put, and I, I'm going to lump speed cameras and red light cameras in together because pretty much they do the same thing. They're for generating revenue. Mm -hmm. The problem with, they say, we're going to put them, um, a speed camera in front of a school. Well, who doesn't want to protect children? But what happens is your son or daughter is driving to school and they go through the red light, uh, the speed camera, they're doing 10 miles an hour over or 11 miles an hour over, and they trigger it on Monday. Now, nothing comes to you and you don't hear about it. If there was a policeman, he would have stopped your son or daughter and said, you were speeding, here's a ticket, go home and tell your parents. There's immediate cessation of the activity and you protect that child and others from somebody speeding. But there's no policeman. So what happens then Tuesday, they go through the same camera. Wednesday, they go through the camera. Thursday, by the time they go through the camera a fourth time, you're getting in the mail that morning, Monday's ticket. So then you, you've got four or five tickets that have come and you've allowed this to continue to happen that long. You've got a camera up at the school, and there's an incident in the school or down the street. There's a robbery at the 7-Eleven. Camera ain't going to help you. But if you had a police officer there, they could leave that and go, go assist. So there are a lot of things we said specifically, and this is what you've got to watch for. <coughs> the things that the legislature placed as specific prohibitions on the speed cameras. One, we said you, could, you couldn't use those uh, speed cameras that uh, you couldn't give the individuals who hold the contracts a incentive per ticket, but they do. There are some places that just pay right out. You get $16 for every ticket that is issued. Good Lord. We specifically said to the legislature you didn't want to do that because you didn't want to have an incentive for them to issue more tickets. You wanted to have the incentive on safety and making sure the ticket was written correctly. The other problem that they do is supposedly the towns are supposed to be limited to 10% income of what their overall revenue is. The reason the municipalities are getting, uh, how they're getting around this is they're saying, okay, we'll include certain things 
in that, um, because accepted from that, are those expenditures that have to do with public safety and such. So they'll start moving certain things into other bookkeeping areas so that they can make it look like less revenue is coming in and a lot more revenue is coming in than the legislature said would have been allowed in the 10%. So that's another way that they're moving. And there are prohibitions that are put in by the legislature that are totally ignored by the municipalities and the uh, individuals who are responsible for making sure that the they're correct on the information that goes out are not being held accountable. You got, I think it's 8,000 currently in Baltimore City tickets that were issued they were going in the wrong direction. They had them going northbound, they were going southbound. Baltimore City has not paid those people back their money. And this comes down to the biggest problem with the, with the red light cameras. And we've had, excuse the, I'm trying to think of a better term, but it's a, a bastardization of the legal process. They say it's not a criminal act because there's no tickets, there's no points assessed. Because it's not a criminal conviction, not, I'm also, I should have told you, an attorney. I've been an attorney for 23 years, I'm a trial lawyer. Because there are no points assessed, they don't have to allow you to confront your accuser because it's not a criminal, it's civil. So when the courts, who should be standing up and saying, wait a minute, you can't turn around and ticket an inanimate object and hold the owner of the inanimate object responsible. If you loan your son or daughter the car, or your neighbor borrows your car, and they go through, they don't get the ticket. You do. <laughs> There's no place else that I know of in the law that the burden then shifts to you when you go to court to bring the culprit into court and to tell the court, this is the person, not I, who was responsible. And if you can't do that, you're responsible for paying because the car is in your name. Now, I can't find any other analogous situation in the law where we share a burden that way. The court should say that, no, no matter how you color this, just like it's a, you know, if it's a tax or if it's a fee, no matter how you color this, it's a criminal citation. You're going, they're going to take away your car if you don't pay the tickets. There's no way that the court should allow this. And I fault the courts just as much as I do the legislators. They're doing it for greed. The court has no uh, excuse for not stepping up and saying, wait a minute, this is wrong. So now they bring you in like cattle. They bring everybody in on, on speed ticket day. And the court looks out and says, okay, there will only be one excuse. And that excuse is that you weren't driving. And if you weren't driving, you have to have the person here who was. That's wrong. The other thing that I uh, see that people will do is, and I got one once, and I went in, and I said, you know, I, I want to have them here, and I want to see who, who calibrated it, just like you do with a DUI and such. You want to know who calibrated it, um, where did they set it, who was operating it, where was it pointed, and the person in front of me goes, well, there, I heard a siren, and that's why I went out into the middle, and I was getting away. Second one goes up, I heard a siren. I'm like, I'm not going upset. I'm going to say the truth. Well, I got to take, you know, I have to pay. <laughs> you know, so you're honest and you tell the truth. They won't let you bring in and subpoena the individual who's supposed to be calibrating this instrument. Uh. Um, you're being asked to defend yourself against a machine, and the individuals responsible for that machine are not being asked to come in. So these are serious, serious, as far as I'm concerned, incursions into your liberty. Uh, if you're supposed to be able to have some sort of a fair trial. And because it's only $40, and you gotta take a day off work, drive to some place you may never have been, and they've got this you know, blurry image, and they say it's your car, and you weren't there. One of the ones I read about when we did the research here the other day is, recently they told somebody they were doing 100 miles an hour in a 30 mile zone, in the middle of rush hour, in the middle of the city. <laughs> they said, there was absolutely no way. They paid the $40. After the press got a hold of it, they made a stink. The town said, you know, obviously we're wrong. We'll send back the $40. It was a very windy day. <laughs> that, that was the answer. But what about the other thousands of people who are sending their $40 in because they don't want to be bothered? So there, there are some real serious concerns. And what you need to do is, you know, go and hold those officials and ask them, show us where the money's going. Show us the amount of money you were making before this came in. Show us what this is supposed to do for public safety. So all of a sudden, what they'll do is say, we were putting in $10,000 for public safety last year, or $100,000.
when the revenue comes in now from the cameras, they don't put it, so you got 200,000, they now take that old 100,000 out, move it somewhere else, and so it generates no additional revenue for public safety. They're, they're not prohibited, as you are um, in education, of keeping a maintenance of effort. They're not prohibited from taking the money out. If you, in schools, the towns and the county, the county can't give a million dollars to the Board of Education this year, and then next year only give them 900,000 because the state gave them an extra 100,000. They have to always give what they did the year before. With the red light cameras, they're allowed to take the money out as the money comes in from the red light cameras. And that's wrong. If, you're, if it's for safety, and that's what it's supposed to be used for, then you should be putting it in as addition to the monies that were going in previously. That's pretty much the whole gestalt, you know, the big picture of what it is with the red light cameras. Uh, open up, anybody has any questions at all? Yes, ma'am. Uh, do they have any kind of statistics that show that this actually helps public safety in any way? The, the statistics show just the opposite. They show that what happens is your rear end collisions go up. They, the, the argument is well, they're less serious. You know, tell that to the guy with the whiplash or the woman with the whiplash. And if you have, you know, 50 people with whiplash, but you get one person who gets T-boned, and now with the airbags on the side, with the steel rails, the technology in the vehicles has changed from the time that they did these studies. And I think that they should do, you know, new studies to find out even if the T-bone accidents are going to be more severe if they do occur as opposed to the rear end collisions. But no, and the other thing that happens is you used to be able to, and the law says, you can enter the area on the yellow light that is the intersection because it's yellow. Now the camera takes your picture and you're in there when it turns red, you are guilty, even though you're <coughs> on the yellow. So now you're guilty because the light's red and you're in the intersection. And the way the law reads, as long as you entered on yellow and it turned red, you were okay. You had to proceed with caution. So now they've changed that to be, I'm sorry, we caught you with the red light in the intersection. So people slam on the brakes or they speed to get through the intersection. Either way, you're creating a more hazardous situation. And there's no indication that it, it helps at all with respect to the red light cameras or the speed cameras. The speed cameras, have any of you been to the major areas where the speed cameras are? What happens? Everybody's Yep. <clears throat> you know, yep. they, they speed up immediately as soon as they get through. And all it's going to do <laughs> for people who don't know it's there is catch them unaware, so you're going to have more accidents occurring there. One of the interesting things that's going to happen, I don't know if you've been watching the news, is more and more often there's acts of public violence against these uh, cameras where they're either spray painting them or taking cars and driving them into them. <laughs> and at first, you know, I would not know that or, or say people should do that but in looking at it how is that any different from the guys who dressed up like indians and climbed aboard those ships and dumped the tea right. because they were upset yeah. with what the government was doing is it really the same thing mm -hmm. you're upset with an act the government is taking you feel it's you know, yes sir Continue. oh i thought you were raising your hand go ahead, well, was, no, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll. well i was going to say um isn't an easier way to deal with that to uh kind of try to defeat the cameras using other means like um, hiding your license plate. That would be illegal and you'd get a ticket for hiding your license plate. Don't get away <laughs> from the government trying to do something to you because you know they don't so it, you spray stuff on it, you put the you know the plastic over. All of those are you know, you can get a ticket for that. I have a question. <laughs> um, finding out the, the, for the towns or the municipalities that do have red light cameras or speed cameras, um, I believe it's called the, the CAFR or the CAFR, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. Am I, am I correct in that? Where each can, um, that's the that's the that's not the budget, but that's where that that's the detailed yes. uh, thing that that says where the money would go and stuff like that. Well, you gotta know. Here's the problem. They'll put the money in there, but you got to know to look to see if they took money out from somewhere else. So they'll say, yeah, we're sending 100000 over for public safety. But last year, was there another 100000 that they've now moved? And they violated the spirit and the intent of the legislation. So that's what you got to watch for. You, you, know, you also got to find out how much uh, is going to the people <coughs> who are running these machines. They are not supposed to get paid. You know, we don't want them saying, the more people we test, the more we mm -hmm. make. We want them to say, our machines will work right and we will 
be there for public safety. You know, and there's all kinds of things that they really, how does it stop one accident? It doesn't stop an accident. It simply catches somebody who's sped later. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do anything until after the fact. So that's the problem with both the red light cameras and the uh, speeding cameras, is they do nothing to prevent. I'd rather you put up uh, a bumper, a a bumper uh, on roadblock in, in, in the school area so that you have to slow down and go over it, and you, that way you actually slow down. Mm -hmm. All the camera does is catch you speeding, and if the child's there, they still get hit. But if you put the road bump up, which will cost less and w won't have a reoccurring cost, it's going to slow you down. There are things that can be done to achieve the goal of protecting children in school zones without intruding on your liberties. The ostensible goal. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. It's my understanding that law enforcement are exempt from speed cameras and red light cameras. No, they're, they're not. But that's the same as I was coming down here and the trooper passing me on my left was doing about 84 without his lights on, and I'm thinking if I got on his tail and stayed at 84, would I get in trouble because he's I can have answer that for you. Pardon me? I can answer that for you. The answer is yes. They're not exempt. No, I'm saying if you got behind that, I, I was driving home when I lived in Annapolis. I was driving home behind an officer, was not really paying attention to my speed because I'm driving behind an officer. No. That guy got in another lane, he was speeding, got in another lane, slowed down, came up behind me and gave me a ticket. And, and when you got to court, you should have said, officer, did you have your lights on? No. He what? was not at the court, but they, I, I, told, I said... And that's not guilty? Yep. He wasn't there. No, I, I didn't get the points that I was supposed to get, but he, I mean, I wasn't, it's not like I was like, mm-hmm, <clears throat> telling this police officer, but he said I was, he, he gave me a ticket for following too closely, which I was not, and he gave me a ticket for speeding. He didn't have well, his lights on, he was not doing anything but breaking the law. police aren't supposed to give you a ticket for a violation that occurs to them. They can witness it to another. But yes, you, you made my point. The police will, you know, I think they're not supposed to be exempt, but when they send the ticket to the station and say, Officer so-and-so ran through the red light, what are they going to think? Officer so-and-so was in hot pursuit? He was, you know, running out to do something important, or she was running out to do something important? I don't think, well, I, that's a good question for all of you. Go and see how many officers have been... You know, I can call down and ask, you know, and we'll find out how many officers have actually been required to pay a uh, speed, you know, a red light ticket or a speeding ticket, uh, or through a speed zone. That's a pretty minuscule number. I would think so. Yes, it shouldn't take them long to figure that out. <laughs> yes, sir. Is anyone concerned about these cameras being used for more than just traffic violations, such as surveillance? Concerned about it? Yes, here's, here's another thing that they're doing. Um, in the Jersey Turnpike, they had done this. They put the speed cameras along the turnpike. And so what they were doing is, all of a sudden you entered at, you know, exit 27, and you en exit at exit 94, and they were able to figure out how long it took you to get from 27 to 84, and you get a ticket in the mail because your average speed exceeded what was legally allowed. And so they were ticketing people like that. And, you know, that became a very, a real concern as to whether or not they're going to be putting them along our highways and just monitor how long from point A to point B. No. Okay. Here in Easton, my, my, oh, oh, go, go ahead. The concern that I raised is here's the problem. Um, you're walking out the paper, and you're walking out to get the newspaper in the morning. You got your robe on, your slippers. You lean over to get the paper, and all of a sudden somebody comes zooming by your house, and it goes click. And there you are in your robe and your picture, you know, standing there in somebody else's, you know, speed camera. Is mm -hmm. it possible? Yes, you know, possibly. What if you're driving in the car with somebody that doesn't happen to be your significant other, and they get the picture? You know, they say we take care of this. We only take the picture of the uh, actual plate, and that's how they get around saying we're not going to take your individual picture, but you, the owner of the car, are going to be responsible if we get your plate. Okay. I'm sorry, you, somebody else. Um, here in Easton, they attempted, I think it was either a red light camera, I believe it was, is what they t attempted on the parkway, but the state denied them the permit to do that. Um, and I don't, I'm not exactly sure what the grounds were. Um, I believe they said that. that because the speed limit, it, because it was a parkway, the speed limit. Um, I think we limited it. That, that, that it may have been 30 mile per hour zones, or there, there was a limit on the original ones that came out, and then you could only go so many. You had to go so many miles over that, and it may have been a difference. I don't know. I'm not familiar with it, but if you want me to, I can, you know, get an answer. 
just yeah, I just wanted to point that out that there, there were there, there, although our town was was of course drooling over the potential of having all this money come in, um, that uh, the state eventually did say no, it's just not was not the zone for that, or because it's a parkway, they can't put that on there uh, for red light. I think it was. So uh, there is sometimes I guess we can use their laws against them. <laughs> it, well, I'm sure if they were getting their share, they would have found a way to get it in there. No doubt. <laughs> um, or it may have been competition or something. They have <coughs> Is there any other questions on this? Yes, sir. Um, one of the things I have read online, a couple officers spoke out against the cameras because they don't allow for officer discretion, which is something they're trained to do. How much opposition do you see against the cameras from law enforcement? I think most law enforcement feel that <coughs> There's, they serve a much more universal purpose being there, and they can do more things. I gave you the example. Somebody robs a 7-Eleven, the camera don't do you a bit of good. You know, somebody's in the school doing mischief, it doesn't help you to have a camera in front of the school. And I'd much rather have an officer give an immediate notification to my son and daughter that they did something wrong. So they come home and tell me so I can make sure the behavior is quickly modified as opposed to waiting until the sixth ticket comes in. So I, most officers, I haven't seen any officers come out and say, yeah, this is the best you know, idea. Um, but I don't know that they really have uh, any, they're not really in the <coughs> equation because it's done aside from them and it's not a legal matter, it's a civil matter. I don't agree with that. That's what, how they call it. Yes, sir. Thanks, uh, because I think um, you're seeing, you see, or here's Rumble, because you can go police start to come to Easton or wherever. What's the best way as citizens to stop? How many council men or women you have? Five. You make Monday councilwoman day, every single person call her. Tuesday is councilman B, you call them and you put the pressure on them and you let them know because they can vote it down. They can say no. The you know government immediately on the, your neighbor who you see get the you know standing in line to get cheese next to you while you're waiting in the acne. You turn to them and say, I don't want those cameras here, don't vote for that. And you let them hear it, and you let everybody else know who they are. And when they say, you got my pledge, I will not vote for it, you move on to the next one. You get three, then you take care of the situation. That's where I put the pressure immediately on those who are gonna you know, say yes to it. And if they, they won't say it, say, I will, even if I don't live in your district, I will contribute to the campaign of those people who run against you, or I'll run against you myself, but we're not gonna have our liberties taken away you don't need this revenue that bad. Yes, ma'am. Yes, um, how do these cameras that are being put up in the United States um, compare to the ones in Europe? Are they being used in the same way that they're being used in Europe? I don't know. I don't, I don't have an answer Because I that. know they have That's a lot a like question. in London and England. You know, I know that here's, here's how I'm, I, I do know one thing. They're used more in London on every corner as a spy. Mm -hmm. They're an officer. Right. The eyes of the officer. And what was interesting was, um, when they were passing the death penalty law, uh, I have a friend, we go to the, the, the Ravens games together and he drives me through and we go through what is now the blue light district. It used to be something different in Baltimore, but now the blue light district is when you go through the part of town where on every corner after nine or 10 o'clock there's this blue light and it has a camera in it and it does a 360. And I've been down in Baltimore where they have all the cameras up on the wall and they're sitting there looking at all of it's the command station, and you can see all of the people they're watching. <coughs> and you're walking down the street with your groceries, and there's a camera on you. And I think in Europe, they're used more for that. I haven't heard the problem so much with the speed cameras and the red light, because they don't need them, because they got a camera on every corner watching everything that you do. When they had the bombings in the subways, they had people going down the subway, they had them down <coughs> the stairs, they had everywhere you go, there was a camera. They feel safer. I don't feel safer having the government spying on them. Yeah. Yes, yeah, talking specifically about Easton, they already have a camera, I don't know if you noticed, at every single light. So I'm not sure what the camera is. Sometimes they have cameras to watch for accidents and, and, and things that happen. Find out what the cameras are. Um, I don't know if they're issuing tickets, but sometimes they put up, when well, you watch the news in the morning at the morning <coughs> traffic stop, they got one on a bridge. And it's just using for here's what the traffic is in this area. So sometimes they have a legitimate purpose. I think if they could see me and identify me as a person as opposed to my car going down the road in the traffic, that's a little too close for comfort. A lot of the uh, 
like it looks like a camera on top of every single light. A lot of those, the uh, the trip mechanism is the camera itself. It's not a camera for speed or surveillance. It's actually the trip mechanism. As more traffic piles back, it trips the light to. Oh, change okay. The there you go. It's part of the. Um, really. Yeah. Traffic yeah. control. Okay. Some, and it, some of them are, a lot of the older ones are big and they look like cameras. They used to put them on the ground. The new ones are sweet. Yeah. Could yeah. you tell if you looked at, at one what, what it is? If I got up on it. I mean, like, up on it. I could, uh, <laughs> the older, older ones look like the old style surveillance cameras. And the newer ones are a lot smaller and they're, you can still see them now and they're just a lot smaller. But mm. that's not to say one way or the other. So it's like a sensor device. Yeah. And, and the that's old, it. It looks like a lot of the old ones are big. So. Did you have any questions, young lady? No? Okay. <laughs> because you have an opportunity. Yes, sir. In your, in your expert opinion, how will the uh, wear carry permits end? I'm, I'm probably the leading advocate on the Second Amendment. I don't know if you uh, watch DelegateMike.com. I, I, I actually was working with Alan Gurr and uh, the attorneys with the Willard case. I had sued Smeagol versus. Um, the state, as well as for Mr. Roop in Perryville, um, I have a permit to carry that is limited to when I'm acting as an attorney. I was suing to say it's not a light, it's a light switch, it's not a dimmer switch. If, you, if I have a good and substantial reason, which is the definition they use, then you can't say you've passed our test. Now we're going to give you so much of that right. You wouldn't give so much of the First Amendment or so much of the right of association. You would give it's on or it's off. What happened? Uh, where we're at right now is after Judge Leg <coughs> to say it would have taken effect today that everybody would have had the shall issue. Um, we were working with the, um, uh, Senator Fry, who last session tried to, and we knew he would do this time, if they lose good and substantial reasons, which is what they currently use as an artificial, um, arbitrary and capricious way of preventing you from having a full exercise of the Second Amendment rights. If they're able to, they lose that, and they, it's ruled unconstitutional, as Judge Lake had said, you either have the right or you don't. And what determines that is if you don't have a criminal history, you're not an alcoholic, you don't have a propensity for violence, you don't um, uh, use drugs, and if you don't have any of these problems, um, any mental illness, then you have gone through the prohibitions from keeping you from having your permit to carry, and you should be a shall issue. The state says once you pass those hurdles, you also have to show a good substantial reason. Um, I've cross-examined them. It's, you know, go, as I said, go to delegatebike.com, and you'll see some of the videos where we sit down and go, go uh, with the state police and the Judiciary Committee. Where we're at right now, Judge Legg lifted the stay. The Fourth Circuit had a three-judge panel that put it in but they said, we're going to expedite the hearings for October. And October, if they have the hearing, probably January. So we're looking at January when we'll have shall issue. If we could reach an agreement, and Miller said he wasn't going to take it up, but I was working with um, Frosch, where their next step will be, OK, then we're going to put up, they're going to be as obstreperous as possible. They're going to try to keep you from having the right to carry. And they're going to put up impediments to your training. And they're going to say, you have to go see a state police officer to go through the training and they'll do it at this location and they could only do 10 people a week and that means you have a line of 10,000. Well, what we did was say, wait a minute, I'm a licensed NRA instructor for safety, uh, pistol, handgun, uh, pistol use. The, if you are former military or um, honorably discharged, you're a current police officer or former police officer, you pass a hunter safety course, you take an NRA or any other nationally accepted um, instruction course on safety of firearms, any of those should qualify you or any course that the uh, Police Training Commission says is necessary, then you should be able to have met the requirements of knowing how to safely use a firearm. I, while there it should be no restrictions, I don't want somebody getting a firearm and being able to use that firearm without not knowing which direction it should be pointed. They should learn what they're doing before they get it. Now the next step they will do, and I'll get right to you, sir. The next step they will do is they're going to try to say where and when you can carry a firearm, and they're going to try to put prohibitions on the place. The problem with that is they might say, well, you can't go in any place that serves alcohol. And on first blush, you think that's okay. 
but you and your wife are going out for a nice dinner, you're not going to drink, you happen to be carrying, and she is going to have a wine. The rule should be you can't drink while you're carrying, not you can't go into an establishment. Because the choice then is, you go to the Italian restaurant, you've got to leave your firearm in the car. Where's the number one place that firearms are stolen from? In the car. Why would you pass legislation that puts the firearm in the place where it is most likely to be stolen by somebody who's not going to be properly trained or using it for a proper purpose? So the regulations should not be onerous and they should not be overly restrictive. What you're going to hear, what you don't hear in the press, is the, the horrible situation we had out um, in... Um, Colorado. Uh, yeah, I was trying to think of the town. Um, Aurora. Aurora. In April, look it up. I made sure before I spoke to it on the radio that I had the facts. In Aurora, in April, at a church, a man got out of his car, went running in, fired and killed a woman, took the firearm to point at somebody else, and the off-duty police officer who was carrying his firearm shot and killed the person and stopped them. The reason was they were allowed to have a firearm in the church. That movie theater's corporation says no firearms are allowed in here. The world is a bad place. There are wolves. There are people who are bad people, and they're going to do bad things. And most people are sheep. They think nothing bad will ever happen to me. I'm safe, and I'll be okay. The sheep need sheep dogs. They need people who are willing to be the ones who are carrying. And if you just, that man wasn't wearing that body armor because he was worried about where in a theater where nobody was going to be armed. He was worried about 90 seconds away was the police station right there across the street. He was planning on having a shootout with the police. That's why he was wearing the body armor. He knew nobody in there was going to have, because they have signs up. Nobody can have a firearm in here, except the people who ignore the signs, ignore the law. So, there, unfortunately, there's a mentality that says, well, we'll just disarm everybody, or if we've got to have firearms, we won't let them carry them. We won't let them, uh, we'll force them to go through these rigorous training requirements. Instead of accepting the unequivocal, Undeniable fact, as John Lapp has pointed out in More Guns, Less Crime, that every single jurisdiction that is allowed the right to carry to the citizens, the crime rate goes down. Because you don't know if the persons have a firearm. You don't know, and so you're less likely to go in and try to create a problem because you may be met with resistance. Same and, with nuclear weapons. Absolutely. Mutual you know, assured mutual destruction. assured destruction. Um, have you ever heard anybody take a firearm into a gun show and try to rob it? No. <laughs> no. You know, they don't go into a gun store and try to rob it. They go in at night when nobody's there and they, they try. So, you know, as far as the Second Amendment question, where we're at is we'll, should by January have that right. I can't believe the Fourth Circuit would not uphold the Constitutional. And if you go to DelegateBike.com, I have every document that's been filed in the federal court, you know, not only the Attorney General's opinion, um, memorandum and Mr. Gurr's and the Second Amendment Foundation's, but there were three or four hundred documents filed in support, and I put all those documents up. So anybody of you can look. You don't have to depend on what other people are telling you. You can see for yourself. One of the interesting things was you go in the Attorney General of the State of Maryland, Gansler, makes the position or makes the argument that we don't need um, concealed carry in Maryland because the citizens have a right for open carry. No, we don't. He argues <laughs> that you have a right to walk down the street with an AR-15 or an AK-47 